How is living in Japan? Mm. Okay. <laughs> How's living in Japan? Living in Japan. Hello, I'm Sally, and uh, together with my partner, we run AA, which is Natural Indigo Studio, and we grow the indigo, then we make products, and we run workshops and make things to order. We met each other in Osaka and then we got married mm -hmm. in a few years and we tried living in London. So we lived in London and Osaka and then we're like, oh, we need to go somewhere else, somewhere with more space and closer access to nature. And we went on a little road trip and we ended up in Awaji Island in Hyogo Prefecture in Japan. Mm -hmm. And this island is great for us because it's like, accessible enough to get to Osaka Kobe and the airport but it's also just lots of nature around. We can walk to the beach in like one minute or the mountain in five minutes and it's green and there's the sea and all the food is grown here like most of our food is grown like within a small close area that we that's that what we eat and it's delicious. So it's just a really great place to raise a family and have enough like space to have creative freedom. So like if you're living in Osaka or London, you like you just need to pay the rent and pay for a travel card and then that's it. You don't have space for creativity. So for me, like oh allergy or countryside life is much better. Mm. We, bought we bought this building. I think about three years ago, mm -hmm. we renovated. Yeah, it was... It was very uh, old, old and have a lot of problems. Yeah, it was <laughs> so, slightly falling down. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was like a hair salon and a, a karaoke bar, yeah. but we fixed it up and now it's nice. Yeah, mm. that's why it was cheap. But yeah. We spent some money for... Innovation. But it's still like way more. I wouldn't have been able to afford a house in London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no much, way. Much, much, much cheaper, even though include innovation fee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we started just dabbling in indigo, just uh, like have fun making patterns, and then gradually got deeper and deeper. And yeah, at first we were using a chemical indigo, and then we. Uh, realized we should try natural indigo then we bought some natural indigo and after that now we are growing our own After harvesting, like we uh, we dry the leaves and uh, uh, we put the leaves like a mountain and uh, ferment it for hundred days. And they become like this, uh, like composted indigo leaves, like this. So lots of indigo in here, and uh, we, it's called skumo, and uh, we put the skumo in a bat and. Uh, ferment again to make a bat and uh, we use four ingredients to make a bat and, uh, skumo and uh, ash water, uh, wood ash water and these are main ingredients and we sometimes add kaibai and uh, organic oat bran this is for like uh, activate the uh, bacteria and then we mix it together in a bat and uh, uh, it takes like 10 days or something like to make a color and uh, 
make it ready to ready to die. Just about history of indigo dyeing in the Edo period, it was really popular in uh, lots of people. And uh, in the Meiji period, uh, the European people invented synthetic indigo, and uh, it's like it's very cheap, and uh, you know you can make a lot of it. So uh, that's become mainstream and uh, natural dyeing is kind of decreasing more and more but nowadays like uh, uh, for the like uh, environmental uh, and eco-friendly reason like people start realizing that natural dye is value and then people start you know uh, more people may be interested in uh, natural dyeing now. So indigo dyeing makes uh, fiber stronger and uh, anti-microbial so that you don't have to wash that much or it doesn't smell that much. And uh, in the Edo period, firefighter used to wear it because uh, it's hard to burn it has a lot of benefit. I've tried various kinds of kinds of art making things but I always find like if you have some kind of parameter it, it makes you much freer to be creative so if you it's like a blank canvas problem thing like you have a big blank canvas in front of you you don't know where to start but if the rule is like oh it's a blue and white and you can only make patterns by doing this kind of thing like having those boundaries really sets you free to be like oh I want to try this and this and how do I make it look like that and so it helps their creativity. The ways to make pattern is like, normally you're applying a color onto something, right? But here you're doing the opposite, you're hiding the white parts. So you have to kind of think about like how you're gonna conceal those bits and then the different kinds of shibori is all about like different ways to hide fabric in a way. So it might be like a crumple and tie it up with string or rubber bands or you might be folding it in intricate ways and then that's how you can make <laughs> patterns. So we make uh, clothes, t-shirts, socks, uh, kids clothes, hats, scarves, jewellery and then another part is like making a noren, like the curtain that goes in front of the shop or something, or some staff apron or uniform or something. Sometimes the local shops ask us to do that. Mm. Um, or uh, make a specific order made t-shirt or something, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. And uh, some or second-hand clothes, ah. they want to dye yeah. to the indigo colour. Yeah, so people have like uh, something that's old or stained or just they got bored of it and then they can bring it here and either they dye it themselves or we can dye it and um, that's part of something that I really want to do more of because um, I just think uh, everyone's realized like oh we've reached the stage where you know fast fashion isn't sustainable so we should um, uh, keep the stuff that we have more um, preciously so like in in Japanese they'd say like Daijini suru, so like just uh, the stuff that you already have, just keep it, um, uh, treasure the value that it already has. So even if it's getting old, you can uh, dye it and give it a new lease of life. And then like another part of the business is uh, the workshops that we run. So um, anyone can come either to dye their own stuff or we have uh, stuff here, like uh, big hankachi, tenegui, furoshiki cloths or t-shirts or whatever. They can um, do shibori and dai and learn about the process uh, themselves. Clearly, uh, natural indigo dyeing is more sustainable than uh, synthetic indigo because it uses a lot less water and is, once it's finished, you can just, it's just natural thing only natural stuff in it so it just returns straight to the earth and becomes compost like anything else that you buy from a shop with synthetic dye the dye is not like that you can't just put it on the ground it's mm. full of chemicals that's what it is mm. 
when we do the workshops, I, it, I like it if the person is just introduced to the idea or can uh, develop their idea of like where colour comes from and that uh, the colour must have come from somewhere, even if it's chemical dye um, or natural dye, like nothing comes from nowhere. It's like must have been made in a process and so if it comes from leaves and is a natural process, that's preferable. And then also <laughs> they might think like, uh, oh, where does this cotton come from or this nylon or whatever? It's like, it comes from somewhere and then when it's finished its life, like it's got to go some, somewhere. It's not gonna disappear. So if it's a natural fiber, it can eventually break down. If it's not a natural fiber, it won't, that kind of thing. So, uh, hopefully the borders are opening up soon and it would be great to invite everyone to come and try indigo dyeing in Awaji Island. <laughs>